I'll ask you all to stay in your seats if you can. You'll get coffee soon. And I'm going to uh, invite our two speakers up here, Paula Dobriansky and Gideon Rackman. Thank you. Paula, you take this one here. Paula, you come sit next to me in the middle when you go. Yeah. Gideon, you you'll stay there. I'll bring Paula here. Yeah. Right, we're going to move. We're going to move seamlessly on. I know we've got a lot crammed in, but you will get a full half an hour coffee break coming up um, after this. So, welcome to the first sort of panel session of this London conference. Um, I'm delighted to have with me here uh, in the room, to my left immediately, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky. Um, I'm just going to say that you have information about everyone's bios, both in the written programs and in the online details. So I'm not going to say too much about all of that. Um, senior fellow now for the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Belfer Center at Harvard Kennedy School, um, but a former Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, um, with some very useful experience for the purpose of this conference, several of the global forums that you established for the United States in that time. But she's held a raft of senior positions in the US government, including, importantly, in the National Security Council, working on a lot of topics that must feel like they have echoes uh, of today, Paula. But thank you very much. And we co-chair the World Economic Forum right. uh, uh, Geopolitics Council. So uh, great to, we keep meeting online. Great to see you again in person, uh, Paula. Thank thanks for being here. Uh, Gideon Rackman. One of those people I can say needs no introduction uh, to a group that is deeply immersed in international affairs, which all of you are. Um, uh, the chief uh, foreign affairs commentator for the Financial Times, a position he's held for quite a while. Um, very much enjoy reading Gideon's uh, analysis, his thoughts. But if you have an opportunity, he's also very well timed on his books. Um, and his latest one, The Age of the Strongman, um, which was being written prior to February 24th and came out rather conveniently um, around that time, but really does capture, I think, one of the great and important challenges and themes we're dealing with today. But Gideon, thank you very much for joining us. And of course, Pekka Havisto, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Finland. Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're very pleased to uh, have you with us in the new hybrid way that we can do these things these days. Uh, as I said, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Finland, uh, formerly a Minister of Development, uh, somebody who brings, um, actually for this conference, uh, a very interesting dimension of the interconnectivity between conflict and the environment, um, but obviously is dealing with more traditional aspects of security today with uh, Finland's application to join NATO. What we're going to do is try to keep this in a conversational style, as I think uh, you know, Minister, I am going to start with you. We will have um, uh, a quick discussion between us in the panel here, and I will start with the, with the minister in a minute with a, with a question to him, and then turn to some questions to uh, our panelists here, uh, and then we'll bring you in as soon as we can uh, to get questions from all of you, as Nigel Scheinwald did in the last panel, the sooner we can have you uh, involved, uh, the better. Um, and what I would uh, say on that front is those of you online, please, I'll keep an eye uh, on questions that come online uh, and draw those in as well. So thank you uh, uh, very much for, for participating as interactive as possible. Um, for Mr. Havisto, let me start with you. The uh, topic of this panel, it really is the topic of the conference, how to manage uh, a divided world. What are its contours? And Finland was a country that always seemed to be able to avoid the dividing line a member of the EU, but not a member of NATO, largest land border with Russia. And yet, after February 24th, you, with a remarkable change in your public opinion, um, one could say a stepping onto another side of the new dividing line. And I'm just wondering, how do you see this in Finland? Do you think Finland will be able to sustain, um, uh, uh, prevent itself from becoming a front line in a new divided world? even as you join NATO, as well as the EU. So an easy first question to you, Minister, over to you. We look forward to a, a quick reply, and I'll bring you in again. 
Thank you. Thank you for this uh, good question. And, and as you know, we Finns are very security oriented people. And when we see changes in our own security environment, we make necessary decisions. And, and now we did the decision together with Sweden, very, very importantly, to, to apply for the NATO membership. But maybe if I very shortly say, what are the five issues that in our mind has changed since the 24th of uh, February? First, we see the collapse of the European security architecture. We, we Finns are true believers of uh, Helsinki Final Act, what was agreed in 1975, and we, we should uh, have the presidential chairmanship of uh, OEC in 2025, 50 years of, of uh, peace in Europe, uh, we would say. And actually, the European security architecture couldn't do it what, what it was meant to, be, meant to do to prevent a war in Europe. Uh, two Minsk agreements, the agreement of Ukraine to, to, to give, give away its nuclear weapons and so forth, all these agreements are there, but uh, the war couldn't be avoided. That's our first remark. Maybe the second issue is this uh, unpredictability of Russia, actually. It was something that the U.S. foresaw that, that uh, the attack against Ukraine is happening. We Europeans were thinking that Russia cannot do such a move. It's, it's so uh, <laughs> unrational and so forth, but, but it happened. Uh, so this unpredictability, unpredictability of, of Russian behavior is, is there, and it's our neighbor, of course. Third issue is, is the Russian 100,000 troops on the border of uh, uh, Ukraine first as is a form of uh, military exercise and then, then uh, uh, crossing the border uh, making the attack against Ukraine. Russia did this uh, without the general mobilization. So you can gather more than 100,000 mm. troops in one spot of the border and, 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 and make an attack. And then my last two points. The loose talk about the nuclear use of nuclear or tactical nuclear weapons and chemical weapons is a new phenomenon. We are, have to actually go back to almost the Cuban crisis, that it, the seriousness of, of this loose talk that has been appearing. People here in Finland are stopping me at the street and asking that we have quite a strong traditional uh, military means in, in Finland. We have a reserve, almost, almost 300,000 people, soldiers in reserve and so forth. But what do we do if we are treated by tactical nuclear weapons or even chemical weapons? And my, my last comment actually is about the rules of the warfare that has been broken badly. Uh, if you look at the Geneva Conventions, the, the human rights, the rights of the detained uh, or war prisoners, rights of the civilians and others, we, we see now an attack without respecting of uh, uh, international rules. And, and this, of course, is a great concern as well. So this is the landscape we are, we are living in. Yeah. Back to you. Thank you very much. And that actually is very helpful for understanding, as you said, uh, for a security conscious nation to take a kind of rational step, um, which obviously the, the Finnish people uh, are strongly behind. We might come back to the issue of the threat uh, of the use of nuclear weapons, which is such an important dynamic here um, as well. Um, Paula, let me turn to you because uh, one of the phenomena uh, or one of the results of, of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine um, has been to really pull the transatlantic security relationship back together again. It was sort of there, but it certainly been through a bumpy period during the uh, Trump presidency in particular, but a sort of sense of a sort of drift that even went before them through the Obama administration as well. Um, but what seems to be happening now, at least for us looking at this from outside, is that America is sort of pulling together its transatlantic and its trans-Pacific alliances. Um, how do you see this change? Is America actually finding a new sort of alliance structure that it's, it's developing here? Um, is Russia creating the, the, the real driver here? How much is China the driver of this at this time? Over to you. Robin, you asked like five questions. Yeah, I know. Well, we've got limited time trying to get as many <laughs> so, as I can. So, um, because there are answers to those individual questions. But let me, let me try to take a stab at it from the US perspective. And then if I may just add on a bit from what the Finnish foreign minister had said. First, uh, I think one of the significant uh, shifts uh, if you will, is in fact what you just said, moving from drift and complacency that the transatlantic relationship, I think, has been rejuvenated, I think has become much more focused and much more united. So that is definitely an outcome here. 
Secondly, I do want to pick up on something the foreign minister said because it relates to not just only us but the global community at large and it's an important point and that is about a type of rethinking that has emerged of the international order, rules-based order. Why? As he said, you have uh, legal agreements that have been abrogated here and also uh, rules of war conduct also undermined. Uh, to say the least. And so for that reason, I think uh, very significantly, the United States with the transatlantic community and with partners throughout the Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific region are looking at where we've been, what kinds of rules have been in place, they've been undermined, and how can we go forward and, and ensure enforcement. I think also here, uh, I would add in this uh, mix, the foreign minister mentioned uh, uh, nu the nuclear issue. I'm gonna take it from a slightly different standpoint, and that is that you have the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, mm -hmm. Russia, Ukraine, the United States, and the UK, that all signed the Budapest Memorandum, which called upon Ukraine to uh, uh, move out its nuclear weapons in return for its territorial, uh, protection of its territorial uh, integrity and sovereignty. Why is that crucial? Because countries like North Korea, Iran, mm. actually have taken note. And I would say that this question of nuclear proliferation, it's a broader issue than the foreign minister had mentioned. Looking at it in the global context, it's back uh, very much front and center as a result of, of this invasion. And let me, if I may, mention a couple more. NATO, because going back to your question, yep. uh, certainly I think it really was very striking as an outcome here that we have uh, the issue of the expansion of NATO. Countries like Sweden, Finland, uh, neutral countries that have, uh, uh, have uh, now applied for NATO membership. Then we also have a shift in German foreign policy. There have been some ebbs and flows since uh, Chancellor Schultz made his initial statement uh, uh, a number of weeks uh, uh, ago, or several, I guess about a month and a half, two months ago. But having said that, nevertheless, there have been still some changes, um, uh, clearly in terms of what's happening in Germany that also has had ramifications. Mm -hmm. And if I may, just a couple more uh, in, this, in this mix. I can't help myself because of the previous panel energy security. It's really come front and center. And I think the last panel and the discussion about what's happening here in, in, in the UK actually is symptomatic of what many countries are dealing with. The fact that Germany is now looking at LNG terminals, the fact that you have um, uh, others, uh, what's known as the Three Seas Initiative, initiated by Poland, and then also with uh, Croatia and all the Central European countries, uh, in the middle are really focusing on moving away from the weaponization mm. of energy resources by Russia and really taking really concrete action, action to be less dependent in that energy sphere. A very striking outcome. Finally, uh, it's, it's very noteworthy that Ukraine itself, I think because of the invasion, has become much more unified. I mean, when you look at it, quite not the, the result that uh, Putin had uh, expected. Mm. And actually, one more, I said that was final, but one more because you did mix in Asia because it was a long question. Um, I will say that we've witnessed also the real growth of new security alignments. The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which was initiated in 2007, if those of you know it, Japan initiated, it's Japan, India, US, and Australia. It's very significant, it's been upgraded. It was upgraded in the last administration in the United States, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration has taken it. It's put it at a head of state level with a very concrete agenda, very significant. And then what are they dealing with? Not just originally the military exercises, the Malabar exercises, but quite frankly, now they're going into dealing with supply chains. Mm -hmm. And also, how do you even deal with still the aftermath of the pandemic, if you will, and including South Korea, New Zealand, and Vietnam. I'll stop there. No, thank you, and that, especially that last point. So what I can see from the description you just provided there is a sort of coming together, I don't know, rebirth is too strong a term, but a rejuvenation, perhaps, 
um, of uh, forms of cooperation and a modernization of forms of cooperation, as you just noted there, um, between America and its allies, both in the Pacific uh, and across the Atlantic. So block maybe is too strong a term, but certainly on the transatlantic side, maybe together this group of countries uh, take a bit more share uh, of their interdependence than they had before. Um, Gideon, that brings me to you, because on the other side of this is kind of Russia and China. I'm just wondering, I mean, comment by all means if you want on what you heard from Foreign Minister Havisto and, and, and from uh, Paula uh, just now. But um, Russia and China seem to be being drawn together, pushed together, <laughs> heading in a direction. This, this is an, it's not an axis, it's definitely not an alliance, but no limits. Um, how do you read their coming together? Is this becoming um, the opposition to the block, if I can call it that, on the other side that America is gathering around itself? What's going on in the Russia-China dynamic, in your opinion? I mean, in, in short, I think yes. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that that is what's happening. Obviously, there are nuances and complications. It's not like the Warsaw Pact versus NATO. It's, it's not as rigid as that. But I do think that there is a strong identity of interest now between Russia and China. Um, and that viewed from the other side, from Washington in particular, they are seen as a kind of a couple um, who are equally threatening, if you like, that the, 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 the war in Ukraine has not meant that suddenly everyone in America is focusing on Russia to the exclusion of China. On the contrary, I think that the Americans, I mean, Paul will know better than me, still see China as the m more significant long-term adversary. But on, on the Russia-China kind of collaboration, you know, we've heard mention of February the 24th, obviously, we all know what happened then. But February the 4th was a really important date when she and Putin met in Beijing just before the uh, invasion and issued a joint statement. And that joint statement, I mean, you alluded to the No Limits Partnership that they talked about that, but it really repays reading because it's quite, um, it's quite a good statement, I think, of if you want to understand where they're coming from. And I think that the reason that Russia and China are close together is that there's a geopolitical element to their partnership and an ideological element to their mm -hmm. partnership. The ideological bit is that, again, in that statement, there are explicit references to what they regard as American attempts to essentially overthrow their governments. They talk about color revolutions. Now, I think that is sort of paranoid uh, misinterpretation uh, because they tend to see what happened in Ukraine in 2004 and then in 2014, or what happened in Hong Kong as not spontaneous, mm. but as mm. the CIA or whoever stirring this up. And that is the kind of joint uh, whether view of, of Xi and Putin, whether it's a, they believe it or whether it's a convenient explanation, that is their argument, that we are facing a West that is trying to overthrow us, essentially. Mm. Uh, and so that provides a very strong ideological element. And then the second thing is the geopolitical element. I think that they are both essentially in revolt against the US-led, or as they would see it, dominated world order. Uh, the post-Cold War settlement left us with a sole superpower. And we're now in a period where these countries, these two countries, are deciding they want to change that. Mm. And they both want to change their regional orders. Uh, they don't want to see it dominated by America or by the Western Alliance. That is a, you know, the underlying thing of what's happening in Ukraine. The, the, the Russian invasion is attempting both to alter the, the situation specifically there, but also to push back against a US-led uh, European alliance. And in Asia, the same thing is happening. I think China is no longer prepared to live with a US-dominated Asia-Pacific region. And of course, what everybody is now thinking is, OK, is Taiwan the analogy to Ukraine? Will China move against Taiwan at some point? And just the last thing on that, I mean, it, it was interesting on a recent trip to Washington, I would sort of hoped that, speaking to the people who follow this, that they would say, oh, well, you know, the Chinese have seen how badly Ukraine has mm. gone, mm. and they're having second thoughts, they'll pull back. But the view seemed to be more that, of course, they're analyzing what happened in Ukraine very, very closely, but it hasn't made them any less willing to contemplate attacking Taiwan. It would just be how they did it, that they would go in with much more overwhelming force. They feel the Russians made a mistake there. And also, they're very interested in 
the efforts to sanction Russia and trying to prepare their economy so that they are uh, resilient if that were ever to happen to them. But I don't think that it's meant that they've said, okay, this is a bad idea. We're not going to challenge the US-led world order in, in, in the Asia Pacific. No, thank you very much. You okay. Come on in quickly, then I'll go back to, uh, for Mr. A quick, yep. a quick add on. Um, I, I would just add, I think your characterization of the geopolitical unity, as well as uh, you mentioned the ideological, I think is exactly right. But the way, at least from the US perspective, I would put it, I think that both uh, China and Russia have uh, comparable goals. And the goals are rooted in, uh, uh, literally, trying to undermine uh, any kind of US power influence uh, uh, globally. Uh, uh, as you see, they're very unified in that purpose. And then secondly, they also seek very much to undermine and fragment our relations with our allies and with our partners worldwide. Mm. But I would also put at a cautionary note here, and that's just my third and last point, and that is, I wouldn't see this as just purely a marriage of convenience, but I don't see this movement as some strong alliance. And the reason is, first, this happened not just right now. I mean, this has been evolving for mm. even over a decade in terms of the closer alignment of that relationship. I would call it an alignment. And it's alignment that serves mm. a purpose because they have these comparable goals. But that does not mean that there is not tension or differences between the two, and that they're going to be aligned on every single issue. I do think that uh, overall Russia is viewed more as the junior partner, but there were many of us dealing with these issues in the United States who constantly said, don't look just at China. Hmm. You're making a mistake here. Russia has nuclear weapons. Uh, it's a nuclear power and it actually has been a destabilizing force, and you have to look at it and be engaged with both. Well, thank you very much um, for that, and I hope you're gathering questions. I'll look out for ones that uh, uh, put online as well. Uh, from Mr. Avisto, let me come back to you first. You may want to comment on some of the, the uh, uh, discussion you heard from Gideon and from Paula, but I'm, I need to go to, go to a, a very direct question to you, because obviously becoming a member of NATO um, requires perhaps some compromises with other members that are there. The fin Finnish government, we know, uh, uh, reached out to Turkey early in the process. And I'm just wondering if you can give us an update of your sense of how you see that uh, uh, process playing out. As you said, it is incredibly important that both Sweden and Finland move together uh, into NATO as a joint process. The Swedes face a more challenging set of questions, perhaps, with Turkey than Finland does. But if this is meant to be going together, could you give us an update on that, as well as any comments you might want to make about China-Russia? Thank you. Let me first give a couple of comments to, to excellent interventions by Paula and, and, and Gideon. And first, uh, I fully agree first on this uh, nuclear proliferation uh, uh, impacts uh, on Iran, North Korea, and so forth that you, you raised up. It's, it would be very difficult after these developments uh, and after Budapest 94 to, to convince somebody to, to quit from the nuclear programs and, and, and so forth, because if, if it happens like, like with uh, Ukraine, it's, it's of course a disaster for any, any country, and I think we are, we are facing major, major challenge on, on that issue. Then my second point, actually, you, you mentioned the energy crisis, which was discussed during the previous panel, but, but of course the food crisis, the food security issue is now becoming more and more burning when we are looking at the difficulties of the grain trade and from, from Ukraine. We had, uh, we hosted in Finland one week ago, 20 African ministers, African foreign ministers, and I had to say that it was very, very difficult to convince that this is not the NATO-Russia war or, or US-Russia mm -hmm. war that has these implications, but that but we, we all have interest to support uh, Ukraine's sovereignty and so forth. And I, I think the Russian narrative is winning quite a lot of uh, support for example, among the African countries and African ministers, and we, we have a big task to to uh, mm -hmm. to compete with our narrative, what's what's happening and why it's important to, to support Ukraine. Then on on the China Russia issue, I, I I agree that it's not a marriage uh, made in heaven. In, <laughs> in 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 that sense, there are different interests. Of course, both of them are are supporting the multipolar uh, arrangements, uh, comparing to unipolar world. 
and, and, and so forth. But, but China is so much more dependent on the international market when, when it's looking at the benefits of its citizens to, to, to economic growth and, and all these issues. It's, it's, I think it's totally in a different situation with, with that and we have to recognize that as well. Then about the NATO membership, of course, we, uh, we, we had a, a, a tools uh, prior to uh, sending an application to NATO meeting all uh, NATO member states, asking if they have any reservations. I was two times in Turkey discussing with my colleagues, Mr. Sabu Soklu, and it was very clear, no reservations and so forth. So it came a little bit as a surprise to us how difficult the, the issue is now for, for Turkey. And, and, and uh, we have had uh, several round of talks now led by, led by NATO secretariat, where Finland, Sweden and Turkey has been uh, participating. It's very much about the terrorism. Turkey would like to make the definition wider, uh, covering the, uh, the uh, North Syrian YPG and Gulenist and so forth. And, and we have been, of course, answering that we are happy with any definition where the whole NATO agrees on the issue. But it cannot be a situation that you put different conditions to different member states. and, and the, and NATO, if NATO has an open door policy, it has to have one set of rules for all NATO member states. And this is, of course, where we, where we currently, currently are in the discussions, and we hope that this issue can be solved. For us, it's very important that it's both Finland and Sweden that are coming together to NATO. When you just look the map and, and understand also the depth of uh, defense and so forth, it's, it's, uh, it's very crucial that Sweden is there, and, and given also the issue around the Baltic Sea, the, the defense of uh, Baltic states and so forth. I, I think it's, 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 it should be so that uh, NATO is covering the whole, whole Nordic area. Back to you. Thank you. Um, look, just two more uh, interventions now, questions maybe to pull these things together to, to Gideon and Paula. Gideon, let me come back to you for a second. I mean, you know, what are the answers, I suppose, <laughs> to, to dealing with this challenge? There's, there's two dynamics which are on discussion. One is can you separate Russia? Should you be trying to separate Russia and China? There's been a big debate about this uh, that goes well back before February the 24th. Uh, any thoughts you have on that front? And the other big question is, how do you make sure that the Russia and Chinese narrative isn't winning? The point that uh, Minister Hevistu just said a second ago, there's no incentive to separate them if they feel the narrative is actually proving quite effective. Um, so thoughts, thoughts from your side on that? Yeah, I mean, I think in the, in the short term, there's not much um, scope out there for splitting Russia and China. I mean, everybody can, can see that there are tensions in that relationship, that it's increasingly unequal for Russia, uh, that they will become more and more dependent on China, particularly, you know, if Europe does succeed in freeing itself from uh, dependence on Russian gas, China's their, 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 really their only option because gas has to go by pipelines. In fact, they'll have a period when they don't really have pipelines that are, that are usable. Uh, and also, um, you know, China's whole narrative is about reversing the humiliations of the 19th century when they lost territory. Well, a lot of the territory they lost was to Russia. Mm. Now, formally, those territorial disputes are, are, are over and settled. There's no longer an argument. But, you know, I know Russians who are uneasy about... Uh, you know, informal Chinese influence in the East, just migrants and so on. And there must be a thought that at some point, uh, you know, Russia, China might want to reverse that unequal treaty. But for the moment, I think, you know, that, that's something that's probably many years down the road, you know. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think for the moment, they see an identity of interest in pushing back against the West. And I think, you know, if a latter-day Henry Kissinger or a 99-year-old current Henry Kissinger were to attempt to fly in and separate them as was done in the 1970s, yeah. that, that probably would not work. Um, but I think so you're probably looking at lesser goals, which are to try to incentivize the Chinese not to come in full force behind Russia. Right. And it was quite striking that one of the first things that happened after the invasion was that Jake Sullivan went off and met Wang Yi and said, do not supply arms mm. to Russia. Mm. And I think that the Chinese apparently were quite close to doing that. Uh, so that, that was one form of uh, deterrence that worked. And actually, it looks like the Chinese are also not backfilling 
uh, on things like semiconductors that the Russians are struggling, you know, can't get from the West now. They probably, you know, some of the most advanced stuff the Chinese don't make anyway. But the Chinese companies, I think, are wary mm. of secondary American sanctions. You've seen them got caught up in that before. Some of the problems Huawei got, it, got involved in. So, um, actually, there are limits to this partnership. Yep. You know, uh, China, I think, would have been quite pleased if Russia had won very quickly. In like mm. three days, it's all over. Mm. You send another signal of Western weakness after Afghanistan. But now they're bogged down. It's really quite complicated for China. So I don't think they like, you know, share our horror or, or intend to help us, you know, uh, cripple Russia. Not at all. In fact, one Chinese diplomat said to me, essentially, the West's proposition is, please help us destroy your allies so that we can turn on you next. <laughs> 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 Which was quite a not bad way of putting it. So yeah. they're not, they're not going to do that. But, mm. but I think they're wary of, of the limits of their support. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And uh, maybe, Paula, same question to you. I mean, could you argue that the United States is actually pushing Russia and China closer together? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to put it all in the United States. We hosted uh, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss in December last year, and she was very much in her remarks and has done since grouped Russia and China kind of as the folks against world order. And the rest, well, you know, We'll, we'll work with them one way or another. So do you think America actually is almost sort of creating the problem by conflating no, the no, two? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think that uh, I, I certainly support what Gideon said, and I think he put it in a proper context here. Uh, first, to go back to the uh, very used term, we are in a time of great power competition. Mm. And the fact is that even prior to the February 24 Russia invasion of Ukraine, the fact is that we've been in that context, and you have to look at what is evolving actually in that context. And even the question, the very broad question of this panel of looking at is there a more divided world? Yeah. I would submit that we were divided <laughs> prior to February 24, yeah. uh, quite frankly. But I think Gideon is spot on in what he said about, uh, look, they are aligned in terms of their uh, broad strategic goals, but that does not mean that diplomatically, the United States or other countries are necessarily in some prime position to be able to split them. Hmm. You gave an excellent example of with Sullivan going to, uh, to uh, China uh, and, and laying a marker down that, yes, okay, in that sphere, they've engaged. But we also know that at the same time, in terms of the volume of trade, especially in terms of energy, hmm. there are now more pipelines that hmm. are being built from Russia into, into China. There already was one that was built some 10 years ago. And by the way, it was at a loss for Russia, quite mm. frankly. But they did it because it was the symbolism of it. Mm. So no, I don't think that we are driving them. I think they already were united. But I might add that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to engage China in a way in which it could be helpful. You gave one example. Let me give one more. One, one more. I was in Davos, and as, as were you, and it was striking to me the Ukrainian foreign minister talked about how he reached out to his Chinese counterpart. And he did to actually engage the Chinese counterpart in, can't you have some influence here in terms of, of, of the conflict? He wasn't seeking mediation, but he was reaching out to uh, encourage them really to take a, a more uh, global stakeholder role in looking at how many legal uh, commitments and agreements are being undermined and China could be speaking yeah. to these kinds of issues, which it hasn't been. Um, let, let, me, let me bring some questions in and then I'll give everyone a chance because, you know, we do want to make this uh, questions or comments, as I said earlier. I'm going to run across a little bit across the room here. Yeah, please there. Go to front, Suzanne. Yeah. I'll try and get people who haven't asked questions first time around. Don't worry, it picks you up well. Thank you, uh, Robin. And my name is John Hevishaw from the University of Exeter. Um, most of the discussion so far about the contours of the divided world has focused on state parties, and with Gideon Rathman touching briefly on the private sector and Chinese business. But arguably, the contours of a divided world are also about non-state actors, they're about the private sector, they're even about the divide between capital-owning elites and the wage slaves of the labor market. And I'm not a Marxist, though I suspect there are very <laughs> few Marxists in this room, but it's still incumbent upon us to think about these transnational elite ties and how they will seek to circumvent a lot of the divides that are being put in place. Because over the long term, that's surely the new normal that we're going to achieve. 
private sector and capital earning elites reconfiguring their world so they can get around some of these divides. So I just be welcome, I welcome your thoughts on that. It's a good comment and a good question and involved in doing some very important reports which Adam has as well. Let me get two or three points in so we can get, if you don't mind, Minister as well. Uh, right at the front, if you can bring a microphone right down here to Suzanne. If you introduce yourself and I'm gonna go over there. I'm gonna get some other voices in. There you go. Thanks so much. It's Suzanne Nossel from Pen America. Great to see you all. Curious how you think this affects the logic of interdependence, which has been sort of the dominant paradigm, I'd say, since we all accepted living in a globalized world, the idea that when it came to Russia and China, you would cooperate where possible, uh, you know, sort of contest and contain where necessary. And now we're seeing this, you know, in the first panel uh, or discussion on energy really underscored this, this sort of uh, forced decoupling and disentanglement and a recognition that this uh, interconnectedness is precarious, it's dangerous, uh, and more of an impetus to be able to stand alone. And yet so many issues, whether it's climate or pandemics or food security or nonproliferation, that interdependence is necessary. So how, how in your minds do we move forward? I mean, it, does that paradigm of interconnectedness survive this? Uh, does it change? And, and, and what comes next in terms of how we think about, you know, where we cooperate and contest? And what is one more question, that gentleman over there, um, well, actually, st start first, just the lady behind you, no, just go back a little bit so you don't kill any, no, no, okay, the lady with the hand up first, I'll take both of you, sir, yeah. Hi, thank you so much, Jennifer Lind from Chatham House and from Dartmouth College. Um, I really appreciate the way the panel is, is not just looking at Russia and China as some sort of monolith or block, but is, is probing into the relationship and and, and looking and asking, for example, uh, is there an imbalance there? And, and I wanted to ask you to go further into that and, and speculate on the, um, the, the stability of these regimes. The, are they brittle? Uh, are they about to crumble? Are they so riven by their own internal authoritarian weaknesses? Or are they a lot more resilient? After all, that has a, a huge implication for the extent of the, the challenge that exactly. we're going to present. Thank you. And just keep the microphone there, the gentleman. Yeah, please. Uh, Henry Nicholson. We've talked about Russia and China. Um, but earlier on, when we talked about energy, we talked about the role that India is playing in obviously availing itself of Russian hydrocarbons. Um, many businesses are very intertwined with India as well as China. Where does that uh, leave India? And how does it affect its relationship with Europe and the US? Thank you very much. Look, we've got a lot of comments and questions there. I've kept track of them. I'm going to sort of uh, pass them around a little bit, not least because I think whether they're stable regimes or not. Uh, Gideon, with your strongman book, an unfair thing to do, but I'm going to ask you okay. to comment a little bit on that. And I def Paul, I definitely want to make sure you get on India because you did these bilateral dialogues and okay. you did one specifically, I think, when you were in government with India. Um, but let me start, Minister Havisto, I hope you heard those questions. I think you did. I don't know where to start with those. I'll let you pick whichever one or two you want. You definitely don't have to do all four. But this question about the future of interdependence as well stands to me as a very important one. Um, any case, whatever you want to pick up. Well, thanks, and I will, I will maybe concentrate to the interdependence. But before that, I, I, I said some, I'd say something about the private sector, because we have You're been uh, in the middle of very difficult discussion that there have been sanctions, and, and, uh, and now, uh, of course, we are preventing the Russian oligarchs' uh, action in, in European Union and so forth. But then comes this issue of the confiscation. Can you confiscate some of the property in favor of Ukraine? And, and then the, comes the big question of how this property has been created and also do we break our own rules mm. uh, if we are doing the pro or protection of private property and so forth. And if we are saying that we are playing according to the rules and the other side is violating the rules, how to, how to handle this quite com complex situation, but that we are in the middle of that debate currently. But then, just a small detail, but then uh, interdependence, I, I, I think it's, it's very important that you, you mentioned that climate issue, uh, uh, food security issue, and, and, and those issues that are really global, global issues that we have to work together, and at the same time, we have to cut some of our uh, links like we did in Europe with the Nord Stream uh, project between Germany and, and, and Russia and, and so forth. And, and this is certainly a new uh, moment, a new uh, 
face and, and, and we, we, we cannot go back to the old actually. We have lost the trust and when the trust is lost then then you, you have to act in another way. And particularly it's it's linked to to energy issues and, and, and so forth in, in uh, Europe. Um, uh, maybe maybe just on, on uh, uh, the third the third question on on resilience uh, we, we we of course have to look a little bit back to the history 1990s I think Russia lost half of its uh, gross national product so and we are not yet there at all and it's it survived through a very very difficult period during the 1990s so they have a huge resilience and we have to we have to understand that. Uh, and, and of course, then what's happened with the leadership, I, I think we, as a neighbor, have to have all post-Putin scenarios. It can be Putin number two, continuing the same line. It can be more liberal, democratic leadership, but it can also be uh, even a military junta type of leadership. You, you understand it's, it's with all these different regimes, we have to somehow survive also as a neighbor. And we always have the same 1,300 kilometer common border. Mm. And actually, my grandfather, 1920s, went with a gun to Russia to change the Baltic regime. And, and when he came back, he said that, well, it was a, uh, it was a good try, but uh, he was more eager to change the government than the Russians to change their own government. And I, <coughs> I think that's something, the lesson learned. The, move, the change can only come from inside in Russia. Yeah. Back to you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm keeping an eye on time. This might be, I think, the last round, so I'm seeing how we're doing on time. If we've got time to get one of the ones in online, I will. Um, Paula, to you, I mean, I, I threw the India question at you in particular. Um, if you want to touch on some of the others, but why don't you give us something on your sense of how they're playing if, it? Yeah. If you don't mind, I do want to touch on yeah, in, yeah. interdependence. Go for it, go for it. <laughs> and also the question about resilience, very fast. On interdependence, I think it's an important question, Suzanne. Uh, uh, definitively, because as the minister indicated in the energy space, we've seen a real shift in that case. However, let's take a country like Brazil. Brazil depends actually two-thirds on the Chinese market for soybean exports. At the same time, for Russia, by the way, it depends 20 to 25 percent on the imports of fertilizer mm. from Russia. And then at the same time, we've seen under the Bolsonaro government, a closer alignment with the United States. So how does that all shake out? Mm. I think very carefully, <laughs> the answer is. Mm. So you have Brazil being driven by its economic interests. Is it going to shift those economic interests and supply lines? I don't see it, but it has shifted politically. So, you know, with interdependence, I think you're gonna see kind of a variation. When I look at the quadrilateral security dialogue, Actually, it was initially just based and focused on these military Malabar exercises. It's now gotten very agile in trying to accommodate shifts. And very strikingly to me, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, both Japan and Korea were taking their manufacturing of electronic goods mm. out of mm. China. They were relocating them in India mm. and also uh, elsewhere, Vietnam, for example. So I think we're seeing a lot of shifts. Does that mean radical change in every single case? No. A quick word on resilience, and then I'll yeah. end on India. On resilience, I, I really wanted to address that because the question was about China and Russia. I don't, I would never, I would not categorize either of them, either of these regimes as resilient. I, 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 I view them as very hard focused. Um, uh, uh, actually, they become much more autocratic uh, and crackdowns that we've seen. As Xi Jinping is going into the Communist Party for this fall, I think we've seen the use of corruption and anti-corruption measures almost as taking down uh, uh, his, uh, 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 if you will, maybe so-called political uh, opponents and challengers, and then also a kind of centralization uh, in terms of state and you know uh, enterprises and a a crackdown on the kind of entrepreneurial spirit that we've seen in the cases of some very big companies, as you know. So I don't see it, would you characterize it as resilient? I do see it as rather rigid. 
in mm. terms of Russia. To cut to the chase, I'm someone who really had focused on human rights questions. To me, all of the uh, demonstrations have been focused on a lack of economic agility and mm. lack of modernization. Even the former finance minister, Kudrin, mm. when he's tweeted and in the past when he's spoken to this issue, he has focused on the fact that there hasn't been this kind of modernization and kind of resiliency and openness. And we've seen clearly cl crackdowns going into this invasion and even intensified. India, India is a really uh, significant issue because here you have, and looking at in recent days, India has upped its exports from, uh, excuse me, imports of coal from Russia because Russia is offering a 30% deal, okay? And then on the other hand, in terms of, uh, of crude oil, also it has a deal, and I believe it's gone up by something like in the range of 3.5 um, uh, 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 in terms of the percentage. It's gone up, let me just mm. <laughs> say that, um, up and up, um, which has intensified its, its, its dependence. Also, Russia is the number one military supplier. United States is the number two. Mm. So the question is, what is the shortcoming there of military in, uh, interoperability? It's curtailed. We have a close relationship with India. I think it has advanced significantly, but this is another case, looking at the case of Brazil, where India has carved out its own space. It might be subject to secondary sanctions, which it was for a time uh, on Iran, where there was also an issue on Iran with the last administration, but they waived those secondary sanctions to give India some space at trying to find alternative means. So. I will say India, we have a strategic relationship with India, it's an important relationship, but at the same time, this goes to questions of interdependence and where lines are in fact drawn and may not change. Okay, I mean, it's, uh, as you said, India's rediscovered this kind of non-aligned past into a neo-non-aligned future, it strikes me a little bit here, but um, Gideon, you get the last word because I think uh, we've got to keep on time and we're going to go straight into the conversation with President Sandhu. So, Gideon, uh, I, I threw one particular question at you, but you may want to take another, and I'm going to give you, as so I've got one offline, I think it's only fair to do it. Um, Patrick Flynn says, both Putin and Xi believe democracies will not prevail. Do you think that this war-induced energy price shock and food crisis is crafted to undermine the democracies? Yeah. Right. Well, I think that actually fits quite neatly with the other question about the resilience of Russia and China, because I think in a strange way, we talked about these two sort of semi-informal alliances, the Western alliance, the Russia-China yeah. bloc. They're both gambling on the other's weakness. Right. They both look at each other and think, you know what, if we can just increase the pressure a bit, the other guys might crack. Um, and I think to, any honest reply as to whether, you know, what's going to happen to these countries has to start with, to be honest, we, nobody can be sure. Uh, because these kinds of regime changes or regime collapses tend to come out of nowhere. And so, you know, there's a question about elites earlier. Elites are often the kind of the last to know because they're not <laughs> sensing what's going on underneath the surface. So that, you know, I was thinking back to my first visit to, to Moscow, which was in 1987, Soviet Union. If you had said to me or anyone then, uh, oh, by the way, the Soviet Union won't actually exist in four years' time, nobody would have believed you, you know. It, so these things c come from nowhere, but obviously you have to make an assessment. I think that for, for Russia, I mean, obviously they're being put under enormous economic pressure and Putin has, cl has clearly miscalculated. And so those, and a lot of people in the Russian elite have lost things that they were used to, being access to the West, fancy houses in the south of France, whatever. So that has to create some kind of pressure for a, for a leadership change. From what I hear, though, I don't think there is strong expectation in the West that, you know, he's going to get a tap on the shoulder anytime soon. Uh, it, it could happen, and in a way, it's, although we keep saying regime change is not our goal, I do think, obviously, people would be delighted if Putin were to, to be removed. That would create new possibilities, some of them quite bad, as the minister was saying, but some of them more positive. I think the interesting thing is that she is looking more vulnerable than he has for some time. Uh, there is an incredible personality cult in China that's taken shape under Xi. He's incorporated Xi Jinping thought into the constitution of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, people are meant to study it if you're a, m a member of the party. 
and she used China's initial success on COVID to, in a way, burnish his image further. You know, there was a, a big exhibition a year after the Wuhan outbreak uh, about how China had conquered this under the leadership of Xi Jinping. And now it's all going kind of wrong. Zero COVID turns out to be extremely hard to maintain. They've had the lockdowns in Shanghai and all at a very inopportune moment as he comes up to this crucial party Congress in November. But again, uh, I think, you know, the, the consensus view amongst, you know, China watchers who are much better informed than me is that it's looking rockier, but that nobody really thinks that he won't get his renewal. But just on the last thing about, so, so their bet, how, about our weakness. Yes, exactly. You know, we have to remember that this conversation we're having now is taking place against the background of the January the 6th hearings in Washington, you know, mm. an incredible... Uh, moment, you know, I said nobody would have anticipated the fall of the Soviet Union. Well, nobody would have anticipated <laughs> that, uh, you know, a president would refuse to accept his defeat, that people would storm the capital. I mean, American democracy looks much, much rockier than at any time in my lifetime. And the, Europe is about to be put out, uh, under a huge test because of some of the energy issues that we uh, heard about earlier, uh, rising inflation, radicalization, say in a country like France, where Mélenchon, mm -hmm. who's quite mm -hmm. pro-Russia, has just now got the largest block in the, after Macron in the mm -hmm. French parliament. So, um, you know, maybe it's just the optimist in me. I, I think that in the end, uh, Western democratic systems have more flexibility in them, more capacity to respond to challenges by change. I think the trouble with these strongman leaderships, thank you for the book plug, <laughs> but, uh, you know, th th their whole pitch in a way is that the West is decadent, weak, mm. collapsing, mm. that mm. I will provide the strong leadership. I think, however, the fault in their model is that because they are so centralized around a single individual, if that individual makes a big mistake, as Putin clearly has done in Ukraine, uh, the, the whole society and country can be in trouble. And then they don't have a succession mechanism. They don't have a way of sa saying, oh, by the way, you know, yeah. you've outlived your period. And, and so there is a kind of explosion that builds up. When that happens, though, is anybody's guess. Well, look, thank you very much, Gideon. I mean, I think one of my takeaways from this conversation, uh, and thank you to all of our speakers on this, is that uh, we're in for a long haul, probably, on the divided world, uh, I'm afraid. Um, therefore, we cannot bank on the resilience. There will be some groups that try to take advantage of it and arbitrage the seams, to, to your question uh, right at the beginning. It might become tougher to do that in the future. But therefore, the uh, uh, premium comes on focus on our own societies, on the strength of the democracies internally. Because in a way, as you put it very neatly, Gideon, there's a kind of ga a gamble going on here. Who can wait who out? And I think there's been such an assumption of the primacy of, let's call it, the Western model, um, that uh, we may have fooled ourselves a little bit. We need to do a little bit more focusing at home. Theme of an article Leslie and I read a while ago. Any case, I won't go on to that. What I do want to say is, could you please uh, stay in the room? Because I li we have literally the President of Moldova waiting to come up on that screen where Foreign Minister uh, Havisto is right now. Uh, and we're just going to hold you in your seat at 11.15 when we will go for our coffee break. Um, well earned at that point. But in the meantime, a very strong hand, please, to Gideon, uh, uh, Mr. Havisto, and Paulo Dobriansky. Thank you.